Well folks, somehow it's already 2020. Don't ask me where 2019 went because I'm just as baffled as you. But a new year means one thing, it's time for us to look back at the year in games for 2019. I'm a little late on this year just due to being away for the holidays and being sick, but late is infinitely better than never. For those of you who have not watched one of my Game of the Year videos before, let me give you a small preamble. I choose my 5 favourite games from the year, however they are not necessarily in order of 5 to 1 or 1 to 5. I just pick whatever I feel were the 5 games that shone the most in the year just gone. With all that said, Let's move on to the list itself, shall we? The first game on our list is a fairly late comer for me as I only played it a few weeks ago, and it is none other than The Outer Worlds. I'm sure you know what this is, but just in case you missed it, this is a Fallout style FPS RPG from Obsidian, the guys behind what many consider to be the best Fallout, Fallout New Vegas. In my mind, it's like they watched Bethesda not making proper Fallout games anymore and went, okay, fine, we'll do it then. The Outer Worlds has great humour, fantastically written side characters and a world that is just a ton of fun to explore. Because they went with the outer space theme, they can really let their imaginations run wild with beautiful, fantastical planets that honestly are just stunning to look at. The environments are lush and gorgeous, even if some of the internal areas do suffer from looking a little too similar. The story is pretty good, but where the game really shines is your crew that you pick up over the course of the game. Through well-written dialogue and interesting companion quests, you really get to know your crew members and they each have their own well-defined personalities. The gameplay itself is very fun, with a wide variety of interesting guns that cater to a nice selection of playstyles. The enemy variety can be a little lacking though, and I found that the boss fights were a little uninspired. Just like your usual, throw lots of enemies at the player type fights. While the game is a little on the short side, this is not a game you're going to pour hundreds of hours into, with just a handful of planets inaccessible on the world map at present, I enjoyed every moment of it, and I fully expect for those other planets to become accessible in future DLC. Despite all of its flaws though, The Outer Worlds is an amazing game that I had an absolute blast playing, and it kept me gripped and wanting to play for hours on end. Our next entry however is one I covered on the channel some time ago, none other than Katana Zero. Anyone who knows me or has been watching this channel for a while is really not surprised by this at all. I'm a big fan of what most of what Devolver publish, and this is pretty much Devolver Digital The Game. Side-scrolling pixel graphics game with ultra-violence, a killer soundtrack, and difficult combat. I made a comparison, as did pretty much everyone ever, to Hotline Miami when I covered this game earlier last year. Despite the familiar, comfy feel of this game, it was still a great time to play. The fact that we have seen this type of game before doesn't mean that the combat wasn't fun, visceral, and challenging. Coupled with the soundtrack that I played even until the neighbours got sick of it, this game is just pure, unadulterated fun. But it's not just mindless combat. It also has a trippy, drug filled story that keeps the player intrigued throughout their first playthrough. The story might not be the best suited to multiple playthroughs once you know what's going on, but the developers added a must-appreciated speedrun mode. While I'm not a speedrunner, I just enjoy watching them, the addition of this game really improved its replayability. Like Hotline Miami, this game's combat can be thought of a little bit like a puzzle. All the enemies die in one hit, but so do you. So you have to think about how to approach each combat as you go into it, and you have the ability to watch both your failures and your victories back over once you've um, either died or completed them, giving you the chance to see where exactly you went wrong. The game, however, is a little on the short side, but it's also fairly inexpensive. For those of you looking for a fun blood soap challenge, I would definitely recommend this. However, let's move on to our next entry. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. It's no secret that I endure from software and that they have produced some of my favourite games of the last decade. You may recall that I included Dark Souls 3 in my Game of the Year list when it came out, so the inclusion of Sekiro should be of no surprise to some of you. This game is obviously inspired by their experiencing, experiences sorry, developing the Soulsborne games, but there are crucial differences that clearly separates this game from their other titles. I still loved it though, and I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. A more directed story with a named protagonist is obviously going to be different to the Soulsborne games, but there's more enough mystery and intrigue to keep me playing. The combat, while lacking the sheer variety of their older games, was still challenging, meaty and fun. You still get that sweet sense of satisfaction as you finally beat the boss you've been smashing your face against for the last three hours. The game has a ton of Game of the Year awards and you can see why. Smooth, fun movement, challenging combat and fantastically realised worlds alongside it. I do wish there was more reason for multiple playthroughs. Now, I 
have played most of my games that I have when I was a poor student on the PS2 and Xbox 360 tons of times. So I don't mind playing the same game with the same story over and over again, but I can definitely see why people criticised it for its lack of replayability and the fact that, well, yes you all have the same abilities, but the game still plays the same way regardless of which abilities you choose, and eventually you're probably going to unlock most if not all of them by the end of the game. But despite those criticisms, I really enjoyed exploring the world of Sekiro dies twice, Sekiro Shadows die twice, excuse me. And even though this game presented to me probably the hardest boss that From Software has ever made, and the amount of rage and hair that I lost due to it, I still had a great time. Let's move on to our next game though, Capcom's Resident Evil 2. When Capcom first announced this at E3, I was a mix of excited and nervous. While they absolutely redeemed themselves with the wonderful Resident Evil 7, they still had years of terrible Resident Evil games before that, but my nerves were not warranted. The more I saw in the trailers, the more excited I got for this game, and they didn't let me down. Resident Evil 2 was my first experience with the franchise back in the day on the PS1, and I played it to the point of knowing the roots at the back of my hand. So obviously, my expectations were very high for this one, but Capcom still managed to smash them. The love and care they put into the remake of this from shone from every pore. It was a fantastic experience with just the right amount of modernization. It still kept the core of what made Resident Evil 2 fun, it still was a survival horror game, but they also made necessary changes to make it more fun to play, since gameplay has already come leaps and bounds since the days of tank controls. While the story was still the same, the gameplay was still a ton of fun, and while the story had no surprises for me in particular, it was still cheesy and schlocky as ever, which is exactly what I wanted. Resident Evil never really took itself super seriously back in the day, and that's kind of why it made it fun, alongside the inventory management, puzzles, bosses, and of course, the fact that it's just a fun survival horror game, and some of the amazingly bad voice lines, not gonna lie, were fun to laugh at. So, I'm very happy that I'm able to say that this is one of my games of this year. I can only hope that the upcoming Resident Evil 3 remake is as good as this one. So let's move on, finally, to our last game of this video, Megacrit's Slay the Spire. I have, at current count, 230 hours in this game. Now I must say that I was given a code for this game, so I got it for free, but I'll happily have bought it. This is one of the most well-realised roguelikes and one that has kept me coming again and again, despite the steep learning curve. For the uninitiated, Slay the Spire is a deck builder and roguelike where you must climb up the spire defeating enemies and collecting cards and relics as you go. The relics will make you stronger and can synergise with your deck or build. Think of them as items in Isaac. This game comes a lot down comes a lot down to, excuse me, your card choices and the synergies you can wrangle from the game's random drops of cards. So there is a ton of RNG in this game. But with enough skill and thoughtful play, you can absolutely turn even a suboptimal deck into a winner. The game wants you to take your time with its turn-based combat, making choices on the fly, thinking carefully about the order in which um, you play your cards and on which enemy you play them. So it's absolutely using the deck you have built to your advantage in order to cinch, cinch victory. A lot of the time, at least for me, I can't make it happen, but I never felt like I got screwed over other than by RNG. But which remains to say that the game is fair. It's all about the fact that I chose the wrong cards or just played badly. And yes, yeah, sure, sometimes the luck of the draw comes into it, but luck plays a part of any card-based game. This game, though, came as an absolute surprise. I was not expecting it to be as brilliant as it was. And for fans of uncovering lore through random events, items, and the few interactions you have with other characters, I think you'll like that element as well. Background storytelling is definitely a big thing here. I usually don't like the start again from the beginning aspect of roguelikes, but I never feel frustrated or gypped when I start a new run. I'm usually ready and raring for the next challenge, hoping to build that miracle deck that would take me through to the W. So, there you have it, my top 5 games of 2019. I have a feeling that this year will be a much, much harder list to create. 2020 is looking absolutely stacked with highly anticipated games, with games like Doom Eternal, Cyberpunk 2077 and Elden Ring, just to name a few, it's going to be fun. Thank you all so much for watching though, and let me know your thoughts on the best games from 2019 in the comments below. But once again, thanks for watching, your support really does mean a huge deal to both myself and Paul. Do remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.